quantitative research, the idea is not to prove something as uh, an irrefutable truth, but to um, gather perspectives and to form theories, or to, to form theories from a variety of perspectives and experiences of the participants that we interview. And so our students have spent a year or over a year working on that. I see a few people sporting some clergy colors this, uh, this morning, proudly. <laughs> um, and uh, when, I was, um, when I went into ministry, there some of you back in the 80s, it was in the throes of third wave feminism. And we were determined. We were not, we were gonna wear dangly earrings and short skirts and flowery dresses and fair faucet hair. And, and we were not gonna look like the men. <laughs> no sir. But then um, I guess after I've been in the ministry for a while, maybe we took that a little to the extreme. Because um, people, people look to their pastors for uh, for their role. They want to know who their pastors are. And um, they, uh, whether it has to do with dress, I don't know. But um, they, want, they look to their pastors uh, for a special identity. So our, our presenter today, first presenter, is Stephen Croft, who is a non-site injury priest in the Anglican tradition, but serves a Lutheran congregation, the Half Actor Humanicity. And um, Stephen is going to uh, present his project on clergy collars. What you see is what you get. What do you see? <laughs> I am curious about clergy collars. I want to know how people experience them, how those clergy who wear them or don't wear them experience them, and how those in the church and outside of the church experience them. In a nutshell, what do people see or experience concerning clergy collars? For me, this question came in a roundabout way. My sister-in-law was sick and in the hospital, and I was visiting her. A Franciscan priest and monk also came to visit her while I was there. In the full brown habits of their order, they looked very medieval, and from my perspective, very interesting. And after their visit, I used my newly acquired research skills that I learned at AST. I asked her how she had experienced their visit, and she said she was okay with it. But it made me wonder, from my context as an Anglican slash Lutheran, how did various people experience or perceive our clergy when they dressed or didn't dress in clergy collars? You see, clergy collars are meaning-filled icons of tradition that we seldom even think about. And as a non-stipendary priest, who worked for several years in a white collar environment where wearing a collar was impossible, who was in transition to becoming a stipendary priest where wearing a collar is a possibility? It is for me a deeply personal question. And last summer at CPE, Clinical Pastoral Education, I discovered that my supervisors recommended that clergy students like myself refrain from wearing a clergy collar when they visited patients in the hospital because they said it created a barrier for them. They think people don't like clergy collars. And on the other hand, I know some equally credible and well-informed people who say the clergy collars open up an invitation for conversation and relationship that would never happen in any other form. They think people like them. So which is it? My research question is, how, how do clergy and the public perceive clergy collars? 
I want to discover in my research, or what I was to discover in my research is that this is a hot topic. If people have an opinion, they have an opinion that is a strong opinion, one way or the other, on either side of the clergy divide. This research attempts to pr provide the data that will help understand some of the dynamics of how clergy callers are perceived and experienced in the church and outside of it. In order to collect the data, I interviewed five priests, four Anglican priests and one Roman Catholic Jesuit priest who have differing views about wearing clergy collars. These participants were chosen for their thoughtfulness regarding their personal decision to wear clergy collars or not. The intent was to garner a cross-section of experiences within the clergy population. I also interviewed three lay people who didn't go to church. I wanted to find out what their experiences of clergy callers were. And I also conducted a public survey, a random survey in, in a train station, in hospitals, and in a shopping mall. I, want, I asked folks if they, how they found clergy callers. Were they inviting or not inviting? Just a simple question. To determine generally how people experience them. I also gathered some information about their church affiliation, if any, and attendance, if any, and their age group. In all, I surveyed some 51 people. So now, let me introduce you to the participants now please note that all of their names have been changed to protect their identity. Helga. Helga is an Anglican priest who is passionate about clergy collars. It's just what we wear, she said. She sought me out when she found out about my research project. <coughs> Betty and Roberto. Betty and Roberto are also Anglican priests who chose decisively to wear clergy collars as part of their practice. And then there's Johan. Johan has been an Anglican priest for over 30 years, and he is passionate about clergy collars, but in a totally different way. It's all game playing, says he. And then Theodore. Theodore is a Jesuit priest who chooses not to wear clergy, a clergy collar, but for some very fascinating and interesting reasons that we will find out about later. And then I also interviewed the lay people, Ralph. Ralph is colorful. Ralph is 60 plus years of age, he's retired and a person of faith, but he does not go to church. Ralph brags about having been a tough guy and an enforcer in a street gang in Montreal when he was a youth. Ralph has strong opinions. And Ralph doesn't go to church because they don't like his strong opinions. <laughs> he prefers to stay at home and watch TV evangelists because they don't ever disagree with him. <laughs> Ralph volunteered to be interviewed about, as soon as he heard about this research project. And then Arnold and Clarice. Arnold and Clarice are part of the working poor. They make it from paycheck to paycheck sometimes. And although they've been raised in the church, it doesn't form any part of their lives. They work most Sundays, and the Sundays they have off, they sleep in. Life itself is so busy just surviving that they can't be bothered with church. Together, these interviews helped us to gather the data and the information that will help us to understand what the experience of clergy callers are, both inside and outside the church. The research methodology that was utilized for this project is the phenomenological research method because it is the most suitable methodology for this project. Our question seeks to discover what the lived experience is concerning the dynamics of clergy callers. Merriam says that phenomenological theory is research not interested in modern sciences efforts to categorize, to simplify, to reduce phenomena to abstract laws. Rather, phenomenologists are interested in our lived experiences. It seeks to understand the consciousness of the people in the world in which they live. Our task is to describe and define the core essence of the experience. 
In order to do this research, existing beliefs and biases have to be bracketed or suspended so as not to obscure the analysis. The interviews were conducted, transcripts were, were made of all of the interviews, they were then coded and stratified into clusters or themes that describe the experience. And the end result is a composite description that presents the essence of the phenomena called, as Miriam says, the essence, essential invariant structure or essence, the core of the experience. Now the survey. The survey indicated that in the population sur surveyed in Halifax and Dartmouth, people are divided on whether they find callers inviting or not. 37% of them found them inviting, 41 not. 22 were indifferent. The spread is about 4%, so it's not significant, half and half. People either like them or they don't. In a nutshell, people are polarized on how they see the clergy caller. Another significant finding was age is a determinant of pre pre preference. This is interesting because these purple slides here, or columns here, show that people whose age group, that's the youngest and the oldest over on this side, age group 15 to 25 and 56 to 90 over on this side, are the least likely not to go to church. But they're also those particular segments in the survey that said that they found clergy callers inviting. That, I thought, was a significant finding. I also discovered that the boomer population, baby boomers, were 14% likely to find them inviting. And that echoes a 2003 United, Ch United Kingdom publication called Naked Parish Priests, What Parish Priests Really Think They're Doing, which studied Roman Catholic priests in the UK. And they found that baby boomers, baby boomer priests, had a non-preference for clergy callers. Also, that younger people had more of, a, more of a preference for them. The other interesting thing is how people said what they affiliated themselves with. If we take agnostics and atheists and lump them together with those that say that they're none at 12%, it comes out to 16%. So those who don't go to church represent the second largest affili affiliation of the people that are surveyed. So Roman Catholics, people who don't, Anglicans at 16%, United Church, Baptist, and non-denominational at 6%. Interesting. So the clergy caller. What we know of and call the clergy caller was invented in the 19th century. It was made popular by the Oxford movement in the Anglican Church, and it soon spread to all denominations. It has become the icon of the priestly office. It signifies to the world a visible sign of church. and reminds the wearer of the vows of their ordination, and the wearing of the collar sets the person apart from the world and is a constant reminder of the responsibility of the office. The results of the interview brought up three major themes. Invitation to, re or to relationship or a barrier, fallout from clergy abuse, professionalism, or fools for Christ. The first theme, invitation to relationship or barrier. One of the, this was the first theme to, to arise. And this was in the group of priests who chose to wear their clergy collars. They saw it as an invitation to conversation. Roberto said, it helps to begin a conversation. It is one small step, always to be open to invite people to a conversation. And Betty extended that invitation beyond the caller to herself as a representative of the church. She said, I see myself as an instrument for invitation. It is an invitation to have a conversation. People will stop, they will come up to, my, to me in my collar, and they might want to talk. They might not ever go to church. In this perspective, the wearer of the collar becomes an embodied, open public invitation for engagement and conversation. Wearing the collar makes them an emblem 
an embodied symbol of the church. When they wear the collar, they, the person, disappear, and they personify in a very real way the church. They become a visible symbol of the church as they move through society. Helga felt like they were wearing the liberty or uniform of a feudal lord in medieval times. When you wore the liberty of the Lord, everyone knew who you belonged to. Helga, Helga said, when I wear the vestment or, or clergy collar, I feel like I'm telling people who I belong to. She said, the collar also lowered personal barriers on the street. She says, even if they don't know me, they sort of nod at me or say goodbye or good morning, and that's because of the collar. For her, it's an invitation to conversation. There's always an opening, she says, to talk to someone. And it's rarely, it's a nice day. It's more like, pray for me. I haven't been very well, or pray for my sister, she's sick. And Johann, on the other hand, sees it differently. He, like Theodore, doesn't wear the collar all the time. It's contextual for him, and useful in some but not all contexts. He says, I realized that it was a barrier to a lot of people. For him, the collar creates a barrier and a distance for some. He says, and today we are the highest dressed, the least honored of professions. And when you go and do general surveys of general populations, clergy are considered just a little bit more trustworthy than politicians, <laughs> just above politicians. And Helga talked about the possibility of co clergy callers creating some distance in some people. She says, I wonder sometimes, I wonder if they're a little bit frightened at first, because there's a background of people being a little bit frightened, or let's say in awe of priests. And Betty also reported that sometimes wearing the clergy collar creates a distance. You get an odd shoulder sometimes, she said, particularly from women. I think it's women more than men. I think the odd man, but I don't think so. It's kind of difficult. It's a difficulty with women in a leadership role that they're not comfortable with. She also indicated that she's heard the comment, who are you supposed to be? A couple times. But on the whole, in 12 years of ministry, she's not had many negative comments. Betty also noted that sometimes when you wear a clergy collar, it has some very unexpected negative results. She, rec she recalled one time when she wore the collar at a dinner theater being held in the local legion that she suddenly realized that she was hurting bar sales. <laughs> Theodore, who chooses not to wear a collar, felt that the collar got in the way of genuine relationship. He says, I don't wear it every day because I feel that it's too distracting. I want people to relate to me as a human being, first and foremost, who happens, no, not just happens to be, but who is a priest. For him, building relationships is important. He says the best way to do that, to introduce them to Christ, to, is to be God-like, to be Christ-like, and just be friends with people. Talk to them about the movies that you've seen, talk about the books that you've read, talk about the death of your mother or the death of your spouse. You know, let's relate to each other. And it's without a focus. It's without an intention. And the intention is, you know, to just be in relationship with one another. Theodore feels that the clergy caller and the stereotype of priest can get in the way of establishing a genuine relationship. He says, oh, here comes the priest. And he's going to, you know, tell me about Jesus and how good Jesus is, but that's only because he's a priest and that's his job. I don't want that to interfere with my encounters with people. The caller can, for Theodore, reduce such encounters to business transactions with an agenda because he's seen as just doing his job. For him, Jesus is a model of ministry. My image of Christ, he says, is that he didn't wear any special garment. He dressed like everyone else. Theodore likes the story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus, who remained hidden until the breaking of the bread. For Theodore, the revealing of Jesus 
was only after a genuine relationship had been established on the road. It hadn't been overwhelmed by Jesus' status or his power or his position. The theologian Paul Tillich said, one approach to God is to recognize that one meets a stranger when one meets God. The meeting is accidental. They essentially do not belong to each other. And like the road to Emmaus story, they become friends along the way. But it is in such encounters that when, when we meet God as a stranger, that our religious life can move beyond ourselves. The next theme, the fallout from abuse. Nadia Boltz Weber writes in her recent book, Pastrix, that her bishop once told her that the clergy wear these little white squares on their shirts so that people can project their home movies on them. <laughs> people project their emotion, their history, and even anger in relationship to the caller. Betty said, many people will have a lot of baggage about being judged. And when people see you sometimes, they see you in a mirror. And sometimes that's painful. This can be particularly true when dealing with historical issues of abuse. The history of sexual abuse and scandal in the church, Mount Cashel, the residential schools, and the two sadly numerous stories of priests and lay people who have acted sinfully and shamefully have forever changed the context of church. All the priests that I interviewed were well aware of this legacy that has happened in the church environment. Johan finds clergy callers a red flag for those who have been abused. He says, all the abuse scandals and everything, people see clergy callers now and they, you know, it's a negative thing, mostly with people who have been sexually abused or families that had sexual abuse done to them. For these folk, Johan sees clergy as a distinct, clergy callers as a distinct barrier and a hindrance to the ministry that he wants to engage them in. There's more of a distance, he says. They're uncomfortable and they need to un overcome it if you've got it on. Johan is aware that there are several folks in his congregation who have a history of abuse and his knowledge informs his practice. The Bishop of Fredericton, David Edwards, recently said that he wears his collar only on the outside of church and not inside of it. Some of his parishioners have been abused by clergy in the past and they felt safer when he didn't wear it. So he doesn't inside the church. This is also part of the practice of Johann. We have a number of those in our congregation, he says. And that's a real trigger, you know. And not having clergy callers on makes more sense to them. People that have been abused, abuse victims, are really uncomfortable when they see it. It's just a negative thing. Betty and Helga, on the other hand, have a, had a different experience, I think, because they're female. Helga said, I don't know whether being female helps me, especially with the women. I wonder if I have an advantage being female. There is a history of clergy not being ideal, and so I think that that's why I'm not a threat, because I'm a female. And Betty, also finds that her gender seems to insulate her from some of the fallout from abuse. She says, the history of the Anglican Church around residential schools and some of the abuses in other denominations have been connected, for the most part, with men. And this is not the case for the male priests. Roberto reports a time when he was wearing his collar on Spring Garden Road and experienced some fallout connected to clergy abuse. A man he didn't know started to yell at him on the street and call him a child molester. He says, an early 20-ish looking man said to me, made a derogatory comment about me being a pedophile. A young man yelled pedophile and made comments to me. Interesting. The next theme, professionalism or a fool for Christ. For Roberto, the caller is a kind of a boundary that marks him as a professional. It's a boundary on, a personal and professional boundary. Helga too saw the caller as a mark and sign that she is a professional. Professionally, she said, I feel like I've gone through a system 
of being accessed by those who have authority, and I've gone through a system of education and challenges to make me think through what I am doing, and some kind of level of education so that I'm serious about this and that. And for Betty, the caller is a useful sign of professionalism, and, pa and in pastoral situations creates a therapeutic distance. I'm not your best friend, she said. I am your priest. And there's a certain level of, and professionalism, I think, of love and acceptance, uh, representing the church and the office, that yes, I am human, and I may be about the same age group as your daughter or your sister or whatever, but I represent something different. Helga felt that the caller was a sign of credibility and professionalism. There's a sense, she said, of credibility, that I am not there with some ulterior motive, that kind of thing. I represent the church and the community. It's a uniform in some way that represents a job that I do in a secular sense. It's a sort of credential. I'm okay. I'm not someone who just walked off the street. Roberto, Helga, and Betty echo a 2003 publication of the Church of England's entitled The Guidelines for Professional Conduct of the Clergy, which adopts a theology that advocates and celebrates clerical professionalism. A clergy caller can signal that an individual is endorsed by the church as someone who is trustworthy and a credible pro professional. Theodore, however, felt strongly that priesthood was not a profession. No, I am always a priest, he said. It's not a job, it's a vocation. It's an identity, it's a sacrament, it's been I've been marked with the sacramental sign of priesthood. I am a priest. It's not just the position, but how I feel best to be a priest in the world is by being a priest, representing Christ here in the world in an interior way. It comes from the inside and then it's exteriorized. The politician, or the theologian, John Piper, would agree with Theodore. Professionals are wise and knowledgeable, but clergy, says Piper, are fools for Christ. He believes that we cannot professionalize the love of Christ because when we do that, it kills it. Programming and standardized ministry have the effect of making it the opposite of what it was intended to be. Another interesting piece is that clergy callers can also create personal boundaries as well as being a signal of when you're on the job. Betty found that her caller, the caller itself was her gauge of when she was on duty. It has helped me, she said, create boundaries that when I'm in a, my sweatshirt and jeans, I'm not working. And that's important for her because creating boundaries between work and personal life has been a struggle. And the caller helps her to create that boundary. I work very hard at creating boundaries for myself, she said, in terms of the workplace. And she wears the collar when she's working or out in the community. Theodore also spoke about a priest that he knows who take, took his collar off one time when he was traveling because he was tired and he needed a break. Theodore said, you're a priest 24 hours a day, but even Jesus needed a break. Removing the collar gave the priest he spoke about time and space to get away. And the lay people, fascinating. Clarice didn't think the clergy collars needed to be worn all the time. She said, but I don't think nowadays, especially in small towns and in cultures where not everyone in the town or everyone in the area is 100% religious, why not just be, you know, one with the people? She also said, I, I don't think you have to wear one to be recognized. I think once everyone knows who, you, who the priest is, who the figure for the church is, knows who you are, you're still gonna be just as easily approachable whether you're wearing one or not. Arnold mirrored her voice. He said, it's not needed. If a priest wants to get up there and do his thing, just let him do his thing. It shouldn't matter. Wearing a collar or not, I mean, they could be more approachable. And Ralph, our colorful critic, he said it had more to do with the individual. I want you to be real, he said. 
I want you to be who you are, not what the caller represents, but who you are in Christ. For Arnold, the caller was an emblem, a symbol of who priests were. It's a statutory symbolism, he said. It's just like any uniform. You know, somebody that dresses up in the military, you know they're in the military because they're wearing their gear. It's the same thing. And Ralph, Ralph said, the collar's like a symbol. That's all it is. It just tells me something about who you're supposed to be, not who you really are. See, I mean, a collar is a collar's just like that. I got a badge on my back, security guard. Ralph also saw the danger in pride for those clergy who wore the collar. He said, a collar is a uniform, and when you wear it, fine. If you don't wear it, fine. It doesn't change the man, but if it changes, if the collar changes you, then you got a problem. I know some priests who put that on, and it's like they're walking into God. In conclusion, this research project has explored the differing experiences of clergy callers to help us to understand and to define those experiences better, not to answer what's right or wrong. For me, it is fascinating to see that both sides of the clergy caller divide can speak beautifully about the same things and come to some very different conclusions. Helga, for example, spoke about how she saw the image of priest as a sheepdog, the border collie, who took her instructions from the great shepherd to direct the sheep, to help the sheep, to protect the sheep and to serve them. A border collie is black and white and wears a collar. <laughs> Theodore, on the other hand, use the example of a family dog to describe his image of priest. The family dog is energetic. She is loyal and dependable, a part of the family. She's always ready to show forgiveness and love and generosity and is completely and wholly engaged in the group. But she is different. She is not like them. She's not like the rest of the family. And in Theodore's world, she, wears a, she doesn't wear a collar. Thank you. Not right on time. Thank you so much, Steve. <clears throat> Wonderful presentation. Mm. Um, love the book, Border Calling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who, who would think that um, the Portuguese callers could evoke so much emotional power mm. um, as both invitation, as witness, and as barrier to some? But, um, mm. Thank you. Yeah. Ah. Questions or comments? <clears throat> <coughs> Thank you very much, Steve. Hi. My question relates to your section on follow and abuse. Okay. I'm really interested in the idea, sort of cultural theory around reclamation. So, did you have any conversations or did you research uncovering the ideas where beginning to wear the collar again in order to overcome ideas <coughs> of abuse related to it? Simple answer no. Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, what, what was fascinating to me was the differential um, between genders, um, and, it, and it really, when you kind of sit with it, it makes sense because there's that whole sense of the, the what what the symbol of the of the icon of the clergy collar represents, and it could represent two different things gender-wise. But no ideas that no. we want to change what this means, and in order to do that, we need to wear it. Mm. No. No. Wow. Mm. Mm. Uh, I mentioned a few things around boundary issues. Yes. And one person in particular is, from the way you were talking, it sounded like they could be a younger clergy, um, kind of using the caller in the past situations to say, I like this similar age to your children, <coughs> you know, you, 
um, people might have transferred issues because of the age of their new clergy. And I was wondering if those themes, if, if, mm. if it came up at all, younger clergy using it more to kind of distinguish themselves as having, having some level of clergy. Uh, <clears throat> one, of the, uh, one of the things that Johan talked about was that uh, early in his career, he's 30 some years as a, as a pastor and a priest, was that early in his career he felt it was necessary to wear it because it kind of helped him build his confidence and his, um, and his practice because people saw him in the role that he was in. It wasn't until later that he realized that very much like what Ralph said was that uh, or a Clarice, that when people began to recognize him for who he was in his, in his role, it wasn't really necessary. Roberto said that one time at a, at a, at a meeting with one of his, um, his groups in his parish, and he was in a rush, he didn't wear his collar, and he realized that it didn't matter because they knew who he was, what his role was. And, and so that was, that was one instance where wearing the collar was you know, kind of a, a thing that could be either yes or no. Mm. Uh, the age groups of the, uh, you know, so the 30 plus would be, uh, would be a baby boomer. Um, the rest of uh, the population would be people, I'd say in their mid 40s on to early, early to early 30s roughly. Yeah. This is, this is just a kind of a comment uh, and a personal experience. <clears throat> Sorry about the wearing of the collar. I used to attend a church in my local community, mm. and uh, you know, as, as a teenager, mm. uh, school late, uh, I had friends there. Congregation kind of knew who I was. They knew that I was a pastor mm. at one point, and uh, you know, to be, to be standing beside the parish priest mm. as everybody's going out the door it was a case of in those days. A handshake or, or a tap on the shoulder. Mm. How do you just want to get But then there was that day, some month down the road, where I came back to the parish and I had been ordained. I was a priest. And uh, to this day, I still have a very awkward feeling because. My friends, my acquaintances, the people <coughs> shook my hand or tapped my shoulder. Good morning, Father. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had been moved out of their world into a world that I wasn't quite expecting. Yeah. You know, and it just, uh, mm -hmm. in, in one sense, I could have left the church that night. Or that or let the organ mention. Mm. Thank you. Well, well, that really speaks to Theodore's comment about the family dog. You're the same, you're entrenched, you're fully immersed and active, but different. And, you know, there's some real definite links between how people see their identity as priests and whether and how they choose to wear the collar. I think it's very definite links between that. Hi. Did you already have an opinion about the collar yourself? I did. And has this been altered by your research? I th I'd say one of the biggest surprises that I had was that I was um, delighted to sit down with other fellow priests and hear their stories about what their priestly identity was like. Because that's really what they're talking about. It's not just a caller. It's about their priestly identity and their priestly ministry. And I found, um, I think the very first interview that I had with someone who had some very passionate Helga, who has passionate views. And, and having been formed as a non-stipendary ordained minister working with a, uh, without a collar and in a very low Anglican church where collar, wear, collar wearing is not the norm, my preference is not to. But here I am sitting with this priest who's telling me about the beauties of how she wants to serve the people, wants to serve Christ, and how her whole life has been poured out because of this. And then for her, that when she puts on the collar, that it embodies the church and not herself. She pours herself, for her, when she puts the collar on, she disappears, and she becomes the border collie. She serves the people, she serves the master, and this is who she is as a person, as a priest. And as a person who has an opposite 
kind of opinion. I know her language because that's where my heart is. So we shared heart to heart, but we didn't share that particular preference. And one of the things, um, we had that beautiful picture of the firebox with the key inside of it. So in case of fire, lock, break the glass to open the door that's locked right in front of you, is to suspend your biases. And part of, part of the learning, I think, for this whole experience was to suspend your bias because that's what parish ministry is. It's about being non-judgmental and being with people presently. Okay. Hi. Uh, did anyone say that when you were not wearing a collar that you were trying to be sneaky? Because I have been in situations where somebody's been identified as priest later mm. and people say, oh, you were trying to trap me. Oh, really? No, I, I hadn't got that. And, and what I found was that uh, people were very, uh, I think some of the, the people that wore clergy collars that were intentional about when they wore them saw, it, saw the collar as really just like a, like clicking a switch, they're on or off. So that for them, if, if boundaries were a real difficulty, if, if they worked 24 seven, when they took the collar off, they were who they were. They were the family person, the spouse, the mother, the father. And, and that created uh, a, a visible place for them to situate themselves in life. And it was useful and I think a healthy thing. So one of the things that I took from this was that if you wear a clergy collar, it can be the trigger to determine what your personal boundaries are. It can be a healthy thing. Hmm. I have a question. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Based on my experience in parish life, um, I'm wondering if any of the people who participate in talking about the community having um, a sense of whether their priest or pastor should wear the collar or not. I've always found that there's a certain, within my tradition, that it's been like the culture of the congregation mm -hmm. that has determined when and where, not just my own personal identity. That's a, that's a really good question. And it didn't come out in the research. And I suspect there may actually be some truth in that because the culture of the parish probably could determine very quickly what, what the practice is on the ground. Mm. Very good question, but no, sorry. Thank you, Zeev. That's a great question. Did any of them talk about the families? Because I've had priests who said, you know, people come up to them, they see the color, they're standing in line to get popcorn at the movies. <laughs> you know, their family is with them and it affects them. Mm -hmm. So did anyone uh, mention that their wife or husband or kids thought of it? No. Well, um, actually, Betty talked about her husband, and some of the reflections were her husband's view of how he saw the caller on her. Um, and so there was some reflection there. But in terms of the dynamic on how being a priest affects the family, um, only, I think, on the edge because they would talk about the stressors of being a priest 24 hours a day that you need a break. Even Jesus needed a break, but no, no, not the effects on the family. Stephen, thanks. I'm, I'm interested in knowing your opinion about when you got up this morning getting ready for this presentation. <laughs> are you going to wear a collar or not? <laughs> no. Uh, I w and, and that's really been a debate, you know, in terms of whether I wear a collar or not. But, um, <laughs> you know, a collar is an icon and an emblem, um, like a headdress or um, like a neck piece or a necklace or a, a necktie or a badge or a medal. Um, it signifies who you are. It's a very powerful symbol of power and authority, rank, and, and it signifies a lot. So when you put one on, how it's perceived might be totally different than what you, you yourself perceive it to be. And I think that's the point. What do people see when you put the collar on? What do people perceive inside and outside the church? And, is, and why do we wear it? Is it part of our identity? Is it missional? And if it's missional, then where do we wear it? So I think it's a really good question. 
So yeah, I, uh, last night before I went to bed, I said, you know, I should just put a collar, a shirt collar on, just in case. And then... Now we're projecting our own home movie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if wearing a cross or a crucifix for a lay person hmm. may have a similar effect mm. on engaging others who would see that. Yeah. Um, I heard of an ASP student uh, who was uh, basically very remorseful mm. because her roommate had been shared with her her feelings about mm. uh, terminating the pregnancy because oh. she made assumptions because of the, the cross. Uh, and, and I just think sometimes uh -huh. either, you know, deter a conversation or a conversation. Very astute. I, I, I'd never thought of it that way. It's just like I hadn't thought of it on a collar. I know some people that wear um, crosses for particularly that reason, as an invitation to conversation, as a witness to Christ and the faith that they have. But it could actually work oppositely, too. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Steve, uh, my question is around giving witness. Yeah. And uh, to me, we're called as members of the uh, congregation to go out mm -hmm. and evangelize and uh, identify ourselves as Christians. And to me, wearing the call is a very powerful witness. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, are we, is there a bit of fear of there? Ah. Really good question. And it was one of the places I wanted to go, but I didn't have enough time with this presentation. Two parts, pride and fear. Um, Theodore, after we had conducted our first interview, and I turned off the recording device, he said, turn it back on. I want to go over the stuff we haven't talked about. And he talked about the question about whether or not he was afraid to wear the collar, because he doesn't, mostly. And you know, he connected with sexual abuse, and then he started to wonder about how he would witness being harassed or you know, with violence. And Robert also, or Roberto also, uh, talked about how he had been yelled at on Spring Garden Road. And he kind of struggled with that whole sense of, well, am I afraid? Um, am I afraid to wear the collar? And I think he was really just beginning to process it. And his kind of answer that he came up with was that it began a conversation, even though it was a negative con conversation. I would say, honestly, it's kind of maybe so. There might be a tinge of fear there. Um, and it didn't seem that whole context didn't flow over with the women so much, the, the, because as priests, they didn't seem to get that fallout from the clergy abuse. Pride was another one that Theodore talked about. Um, he said that pride is, um, is a temptation and a seduction that is, you know, so human. He said that, that, we're, that military uniforms just kind of appeal to people because they're Christmas and, you know, they're kind of put together and, and they kind of signify rank and power and status. And he talked about how sometimes with religious uh, people moving together, they kind of swish around, you know, there's this sort of sense of um, status and position. And he, for him, it was something that he was guarded against and was fighting against, and he saw it as a real temptation. The others, um, I think Helga was the one that talked about, she hoped that um, people didn't see her as boasting, but that she was boasting for Christ. Yeah. You mentioned something about, um, not surprisingly, that it was women who objected or, or, or most expressed resentment to uh, mm. first women wearing collars. Mm. Um, can you say a little bit more about that? Well, it was only the one, one comment um, that came up, and, and uh, we, we talked about it. And it was uh, Betty who found that sometimes it was the women that were the most resistant, and it had to do with authority figures and, and gender. Stephen, did the people you interview wear a round collar or tabs? <laughs> Depends on if they're evangelical or not. <laughs> uh, what, I, I guess my question was, uh, was, did you see any difference in terms of people who, who I mean, some clergy wear both, yeah. but, but some clergy had a strong preference and would highly defend wearing one or the other. Uh, so what, did that play into the, the sense of, um, 
the sense of identity, which I think is one of the big things. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, that's an interesting question because it comes in terms of, uh, uh, of churchmanship. Yeah, because yeah. very often there, there, there are various styles, di different styles of clergy callers. It, did, it wasn't something that, that I picked up on in my research, yeah. Mm. I, I believe I heard her, but when I understand that uh, the perception of people mm. depends on what their experience has been. Yeah. So if they've known someone with a clergy color, mm. people with clergy colors are someone who's kind, compassionate, and helpful and friendly people, mm. that can lead to what their perception and expectation mm. would be. Mm. On the other hand, uh, the other extreme could be the, uh, the sexual abuse uh, mm. type of stuff. Uh, so how do you see this perception of the majority perhaps moving forward, mm. say in 10 years? Wow, that's kind of a futuristic kind of perspective. Thank you, George. Um, it, it might actually lead itself to Leslie's question in terms of how do we recover um, the, the icon of the clergy caller. And, and I suppose the, e the easy kind of answer in terms of the way you framed your question is that if people have a history of kind, compassionate, loving, Christ-like priests who wear collars, then in the future that it might be recoverable in terms of the whole population, seeing it as an icon of goodness and compassion and Christ-like character, that whole icon that we would like it to be. Um, yeah, that would be it. Mm. Stephen shared with us that he's probably the um, oldest guy that's ever been kicked out of a shopping center that's right. for solicitation. <laughs> 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 but thank you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.